Erica, hey, thank you so hey. much for being here. I am thrilled to be here. Uh, super excited to interview you for an uncommon conversation because for nearly two years, you've been heading up your own consulting company centered on helping companies build robust community strategy and programs that demonstrate tangible ROI. I actually wrote that down because I want to make sure I get that just right. So <laughs> nice job. let's nice job. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> let's start with the big question first. What are some of your favorite metrics to look at when measuring that ROI and how do you get to them? Yeah, I think this is probably one of the main things people come to me uh, to talk about and try to figure out for their community. Um, because it's just really hard to do number one before we before I unveil all of the metrics that are my favorite but I think that uh, when I really hit stride at Salesforce when I was building uh, the community there when I was there when I made that connection between community and bottom line business value just almost overnight magic started happening because it it brought community to the forefront that it it wasn't just for fun and games it was for real business value so what i tried to do at the time because it's important for me and i have this joke on the podcast that i do myself that it's like a drinking game every time i say the word strategy or that brian my co-host says the word strategy because mm -hmm. it's like i can't talk about anything unless i talk about a strategy first so once I get an aligned strategy and figure out what it is on earth they're even trying to do, then the metrics fall out from there. And I break them out into two main areas. One is more the big business North Star metrics. And then there's all the health and wellness metrics that you need to also achieve in order to get to those big business metrics. I try to tell people you don't get those big business metrics overnight. Those take time. You can have your eye on them. It's good to stay aligned toward them, but you need all of that other metrics to drive you. So I stay focused on generally speaking um, around either net new revenue. So driving revenue, uh, driving expanded revenue. So like bigger deals, upsell, cross sell kinds of things. Um, I think about community driving adoption, product adoption. And I think about them driving um, down attrition or churn. And then those are like the big, the big, big guns. And then there's also, of course, like self-service scale, like case deflection, people like to call it that. I'd say those are like the ones that generally speaking, everybody wants because it's a problem that everybody has one of those, if not all of those. So I know that was like a really long answer, but I just felt like I needed to add in a few. Yeah, no, get, color. go in. <laughs> That's what this is yeah. for. Yeah, deep yeah. dive. Yeah. So there's a lot. Well, first, I want to say in before the lock is your podcast. Uh, mm -hmm. We will talk about that a little later. Cool. Super excited to talk about it. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the knowledge that goes into even knowing that those are even the right metrics yeah. to look at, there's so much that went into all that knowledge that you bring to the community space. And if I did my math right, which I always need to get checked on this, you were at <laughs> Salesforce for 17 and a half years, yeah, uh, nice. nearly 17 and a half at least, right? Yeah, um, that's right. The last of 11 of which you were VP of community and you were focused squarely on strategizing, one of your favorite words, mm -hmm. scoping, launching and building Salesforce's Trailblazer program into yeah. more than 3 million member strong community where Trailblazers, they learn, they share, they give back to each other. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't sound simple, right? It doesn't sound simple to scale from zero to 3 million. Yeah. I've heard that your mandate at the very beginning was a mandate that you gave yourself. Um, can you elaborate on the origin story of your focus on community all those years ago when you saw that it wasn't just like a fun, nice to have um, yeah. when you were at Salesforce? Yeah, well, I it never was a fun, nice to have, which is why it made it so hard. And I'll explain that in a second. But one just small change just for the industry overall is that I didn't spend 11 years as VP of community. That would have been awesome. I actually had to build my uh, title up, which was one of the things I was most proud of when I was at Salesforce, because community in general, we're forging new trails. Like we, speaking of trailblazers, mm -hmm. we don't really have career paths um, that are clearly defined for us. And I felt like that was one of my biggest responsibilities to the industry, which is what I'm having fun doing now outside of Salesforce is just pushing the industry forward. So when I got that VP title, I celebrated myself, so Salesforce celebrated, but also the industry celebrated because achieving that kind of title still gives me the chills, which is so nerdy, but like it, it means something to the industry. It means that there is a rec, we're a recognized group of people doing amazing work 
And uh, so that's so that's only the only change in your story. Otherwise, it's pretty spot on. It's awesome. Um, yeah. So let's see. Um, super fast origin story is that I spent the beginning of my career in education. I was hired as a instructor, as a technical instructor to teach system administrators how to use Salesforce. And I also was hired to write the curriculum and eventually travel the course. And um, when I was there teaching, that's when I the idea of community came into my brain. There's just hundreds of students that came to my class. And back in the day, it's hard to remember that Salesforce was not a common name. It was very unknown. And basically someone woke up one day and they said, okay, you're going to learn how to use this tool called Salesforce. So head out to San Francisco. And then they met me. And it was my responsibility. Lucky. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. I don't know if everybody agrees with you, but mm -hmm. um, we did have a lot of fun and we, we learned together and um, I watched magic happen in the classroom. I watched them sharing ideas back and forth, regardless of their role, regardless of their industry. They just had this common thing that they wanted to do, which was back before digital transformation was a fancy word. They were trying to drive digital transformation in their organization, take back this knowledge and do something really radical. And so I understood that these were the change makers. I was thinking, gosh, these are the people that need us. They need each other. And when they leave, they're gone. They're just like out they went into the world on their own, trying to trying to drive this transformation. And I thought that was a shame. Um, now I didn't cash in on that idea for probably about five years because it, you know, it's a scary proposition to basically propose a new role in an organization. Yeah. Um, but I did it and uh, I was laughed out of the room, like no joke. And I, but I, I knew. I absolutely, there was nobody that was going to tell me that they knew the customer better than I did. And I knew what they needed. And I knew the product better than anyone at that stage. So, uh, you know, grit, perseverance, um, whatever you want, stupidity, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I was allowed to embark on my first journey as an entrepreneur at Salesforce, creating this, this journey. Um, yeah, so that is, that's the origin story of it all. And from that point forward, it was just, um, it was just pushing and pushing and pushing and proving and proving and shifting and changing and pivoting and learning. I mean, it was crazy. And um, until I think I really got a leader that pushed me towards data and really falling in love with data and understanding the story of the data, that's when everything really started to change for me. And I think that's when Salesforce really adopted it as DNA um as as this that's really when the trailblazer movement really took took hold i'd say yeah can you talk a little bit about that perhaps like getting that internal buy-in mm -hmm. with those stakeholders it sounds like data was a super key piece of that and i'm yeah. wondering if um before you were perhaps um super diving into the story of the data what other types of conversations or what other things sort of worked to help bring people along and saying okay maybe there's something to community um mm -hmm. is there anything that's that like, or even now let's talk about your clients, right? They're trying to get internal yeah. stakeholder buy-in. Is there any like particular say, um, piece of advice where it's like, okay, you have qualitative data, but also yeah. there's these other pieces or other ways that you can try to get and win this internal stakeholder buy-in. Yeah. I think for me, it was all about what's in it for them while I'm stayed focused. And, and you you can ask anyone at Salesforce that's still there, that was there, like what was my number one focus? It was always the customer. But I know that's not everyone's always focus, but um, I tried to do like what's in it for each type of group that needed to participate in the community. Because it couldn't just be me. It couldn't be the Erica story. It had to have buy-in from across the organization. I couldn't do it alone. Um, I did do it alone for a long time. But for me, it was like trying to figure out back before anyone was really laying out a value proposition story to me, just understanding like what did each of the organizations need? And I talk a lot about this, about business acumen. I think that community people right now, we don't have that as a part of our just standard skill set, business acumen. But for me, understanding the business of each of the different key parts of the organization, being able to speak their language, and being able to position the community and their engagement in the community and what it was going to then bring to them and to their business, that was key. So I was basically able to gain um, a few people, a few advocates and sell them as hard as I could on the value they were going to get from 
participating with me. And from there, I poured all my energy into them. And just like I put all my energy into my customers, I took the internal stakeholders the same way. I made them wildly successful and I gained so much excitement uh, that they ended up creating the, the ripple effect for me. And so that's, that's how I did it in the early days was just trying to sell people on this. So really to have to sell it. I mean, it was, we all have to sell it. Um, and then obviously I had to make it come true and then it would come true for them. And then I would just make them crazy successful. So that's in a nutshell, what I think is still today, the way that you need to do it is just lay out for them. But now I could do it very strategically because I know exactly what each organization needs very specifically what they're going to get for their participation in the community attached to their business goals, not my business goals, but theirs. So when you're talking about, uh, let's say, I mean this in the sweetest way possible, what yeah. are perhaps like <laughs> the most closely winnable uh, complementary functions? Like I would guess, but this is from my own experience working mm -hmm. at AWS and working really closely with developer evangelism mm -hmm. groups and the product teams is that it would be like product is actually, there's a pretty clear line from more community engagement, faster like product feedback, better deliverables. Um, would you say that there are specific teams that are the best ones to win first or that you can actually convince perhaps most most easy because uh, they get to see that one-to-one -one direct sort of relationship? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and I 100% agree with everything you're saying, but I would actually say that's not the easiest one for me and is not the quickest win because um, depending on the organization, AWS must just been special and they must have loved, they must have loved their customer feedback, but that's actually not the case from a lot of companies. They they think they know best what they want to build and what the customers want. So convincing product that they need to listen to the community is a tough one. It is a mandatory one in some form or fashion. I basically say that you don't get to say you don't want to listen to your customers feedback. You can decide small, medium and large, like what strategy you want to um, invest in from the start. But the minute you put up a community where customers can talk to each other, they're going to put customer feedback on, on a community, whether you give them a formal way to do it or not. And so for me, it was that, that is somebody I, I go for and I, somebody I really try to align with, but I would say for me, it's customer success. I see the most mm -hmm. connection with customer success because they're generally, as they're growing, trying to support at scale. They're trying and they're they're really attached to maybe different kinds of metrics, but adoption is one of those metrics and that scale and community is just like a breeding ground for that. It's a breeding ground for content. You can push out to different kinds of channels. It's a way you can still give a human touch to people, whether you are literally one to one or trying to manage a suite of different um, different organizations or different companies. And I find that they're excited about that kind of uh, content and that kind of way to touch their customers in a, in a high touch way, even though they're trying to scale. So I'd say like, that's my, that's usually like my go-to and our, our metrics are usually pretty darn aligned at the end of the day with customer success, you know, so, um, it's not a stretch. Uh, it's, it's a hard question for me to answer. Cause I'm like, Oh, there's, there's still so many others, but um, I'd say your that one and product are probably the two that have to be on board. Yeah, I love it. And thank you for pushing back on that, because I do think yeah. it totally depends too. you have to know your it own does. organization and yep. know how they are positioned within the organization yep. and who they're reporting up to. And there's so much more in terms of business strategy yeah. than just saying, let's all get together in a room. You're like, and then what? And now, yeah. now let's strategize based on that. Exactly. Um, and you know, it, it's uh, like, it's also part just to go one more step on that. There's yeah, please. the selling part is really important to that too. It's, um, you know, just explaining that what they're going to get or laying out a correct strategy because a young, young company might be all into that. But as the company is growing and maturing, you need to adapt the strategy. So, and it's really important to understand like, oh, you know, we're a company going from 30 30 engineers to 60 in the course of a matter of a year, that's aggressive growth. And so to expect, but that's also tiny relative to maybe the size of a product that you're trying to build. So you can't say, all right, we're going to create a strategy where you have to respond to every single product feedback post that comes onto the community. That's to tell the, that'll tank the product organization instantaneously, but laying out the right kind of strategy. So like, like you said, it's just, it's not a no. You, you kind of got to do it, but it's just a matter of aligning it with the right 
right positioning where they are in their in their life cycle. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you've probably seen a ton of this across your tenure in the community space. Um, mm -hmm. And going back to the beginning where you started Trailblazers and there was mm -hmm. zero programs, right? And then mm -hmm. there's the MVP program, you built the community group program, mm -hmm. there's Salesforce student mm -hmm. programs, Trailblazer placement yeah. program, so many. Yeah. And so I know that a ton of our Uncommon community members and people who might be learning from this who aren't necessarily in Uncommon yet, Mm -hmm. uh, are trying to work through where they should focus their time first in terms mm -hmm. of program building. How did you evaluate where you should focus your own time, like in terms of the solution you're trying to build? Yeah, well, everybody can queue up their shot glass because I'm about to say strategy again. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it really for me, now that I'm a consultant, like I feel like, oh, God, here she goes again with her. It depends. It's such a consultancy type of word, but it does really depend. But for me, if I'm taking it to a tangible thing that happened at Salesforce, and what I built, why I decided to start where I did was I had really one goal that I wanted to accomplish, and that was to get people to answer each other's questions. We were growing so fast. Hundreds of students were coming through, coming through more and more, and it was just not possible for our support organization to try to, to scale and answer it. And they weren't answering it in the ways that they wanted it, really. They wanted real answers. They wanted unfiltered. They wanted use case examples, people doing it on the ground, you know, uh, boots, what is it? Boots on the boots on the ground or whatever, bucks and seats. Whatever Nailed it. Boots on the cliche ground. Is. Nailed it. Yeah. I'm usually terrible at those. Um, but <laughs> that's what they wanted. And so for me, I wasn't in the support organization. I actually grouped the community in marketing. So I knew for sure there wasn't going to be this giant backing of support. And I'm actually glad at the end of the day, because it created this peer to peer engagement that was unbelievable. And so for me, that was my folk, my sole focus was getting questions answered and getting customers connected to each other that were out alone in, in their different regions. So that led to forums. And I'm still such a believer in forums. I know people think, oh, forums are dead. They're not dead. They are so not dead. They're absolutely quintessential, sometimes the single most important part of a community. And it's just the word maybe it makes people feel a little dated or whatever, but it's just about customers and them ask questions in different topic areas and um those grew from q a to also being about best practices so it was more it had uh, elasticity for me at the beginning but i had to actually deprecate some things at the beginning when it became something that i didn't think it should be and that i couldn't handle because i'm all about like when you have a small team one you need to be super focused on doing that thing super great like it has to be amazing and if it's there to get people to answer each other's questions if they're not doing that they're gone and then there goes your strategy there goes everything out the door so that was my number one focus it started to become about this content repository and me uh, maintaining all these best practices aligned all these different roles and it was sucking all the time and i was like you know not my thing i'm a user back in the day again i'm old lady remember user generated content i don't even know if people use that but that was the thing i was like anyone that's contributing to each other creating customer to customer content that's my jam right now i'm not taking on anything else that so that was how i drove my strategy at the beginning um so that may or may not be someone else's strategy but the 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 net that i hope somebody would take away from that is start focused and start strong don't necessarily think you need to take everything on on. And another thing that I kept my eye on was the persona. I didn't try to take on all the personas of sellers at the time. I took on that persona of that change maker, that that men that was going to be the one that was setting up, configuring, and then helping roll that out in their organization. And I really honed all of my content and all of the engagement on that particular persona. Um, so then we'll be going on where I went from there, but that that's kind of like where I started. And then I guess everything from there, I'll say the, the common thread, and then I'll pause to see if we want to take this a different direction was I listened to them. Um, I really knew them. They're people. And I think I hope everybody knows that at the end of the day, whether you're building an online community, offline community, whatever you're building, they're people. So getting to know them getting to know their motivations and listening to them and letting them be a part of the conversation and a part of the strategy, that was huge for me. So once I got something dialed in, I knew that I was the enabler. I was like, I just need to enable them to get what they want. So the next thing that came to me was a guy that was in like 
Sacramento or some random area that we never went to. And no, we never, and he said, Hey, can you, um, like, I really want to talk to other customers, but I can't come to San Francisco. I can't afford Streamforce, our big user conference. Can you help me? You have access to customers. Can you get other customers together so we can all collaborate with each other in my region? And I was like, whoa, that's brilliant. Yeah, I could totally do that. If you help me create some of the infrastructure and create this program. And so that's the, really the birthplace of the community group program, which eventually scaled to like 1900 groups in 98 countries with hundreds of thousands of members, you know? And so it's, to me, that was the strategy I always had was just listen to them and then put the, put the programs in place that satisfy what they need. Yeah. That's such a, it seems like simple, but it's incredibly easy to overlook mm -hmm. that we're like, Oh, people yeah. just, you know, if they're interested, they'll just come to us. And you're like, ah, that's a very, company centric way of looking at the world when it's like, no, if totally. people have their own lives and their own places who are trying to do their own things, how do we serve them where they are? Um, yep. Thank you for that reminder. I think that's really special. Yeah. Yeah. You said something super interesting about personas and your change make persona. I think it might be what mm -hmm. we would call the pioneer persona at Common Room, but sure. uh, which would be perhaps that first person who is engaging with your brand um, and then may work at any other place that would then bring that, their experience with your product into where they work, into the workplace. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit more about how you chose the change maker persona? And is that true? Would it Would the change maker be like, that first or very first few group of people that would be using Salesforce and then enabling others to succeed with it, like within their organization? Yeah, kind of. Um, I mean, it definitely grew into that. I'd say that at the beginning days, um, back in the dark ages when I started there, <laughs> it was more that they had spent money and they had made, um, a, they had taken a risk on choosing Salesforce, which was a hosted software which was radical, that very concept is radical. Security was really scary to people and uh, that Salesforce was gonna own all this data and what about us? And it's like, that's, that takes, um, that takes some, some really massaging gumption. that idea. So yeah. it does, it takes gumption and it takes like, there's something you need to make a hurt, you need to jump over that hurdle. And so when they came, it wasn't like my responsibility only to teach them how to use Salesforce, it was how to bring back these radical ideas and tactics help back to their organization. They already purchased Salesforce. They were already like, you're going to go do it. But then how do I help them really use it in a way that they're going to stay with us and that they're going to overcome some of those hurdles of, of some risky things that would have been the make it or break it of Salesforce back in the day. Like if people didn't get on board with this multi-tenant kind of hosted model, that would have been the end of it. it you know this is back in the day of installed software and um yeah. so it was um it was kind of a, a hybrid approach to this person that i had to really get excited about this movement that we were all on so this movement happened back then like okay we're all in this together we're gonna do amazing things i'm gonna make you a hero at your organization you're gonna you're gonna come just thinking you have to learn how to use this pro you know program you're gonna go home and you're gonna show you're going to save a ton of money you're going to make them more effective and efficient you can roll out other parts of the organization you're going to be the hero you're going to be the hero and so that's how the trailblazer movement started really was in that room when i was like oh these are the people that have to do risky crazy things um so it was that don't i you know i think about it and i'm like oh did i really do that did i knew i did i know i was doing that and i think i did i just knew that this was the I was in love with Salesforce. I knew what it could do. And so my passion for the product and my passion for these people was like, this is what we're, we're gonna be on this journey together. So this has been a really hot topic in our Uncommon Slack. Um, and mm -hmm. speaking of, that's how you were, you know, in that room and working with external customers who would mm -hmm. then bring, be, be the hero to be able to bring back how to yeah. work with um, Salesforce software. Now, yeah. internally, I'm curious, where did your community yes. team sit at Salesforce? Like who ultimately paid attention to community before it was cool, heavy air quotes, um, to the impact <laughs> yeah. that Trailblazers was having on the business? And um, would you structure your own community team inside the org that way, knowing what you know now? Ooh, so many good parts to that question. <laughs> Dig Let's in. See. I'll start. Yeah, I'll start with the first one, which is community lived wherever I lived at that time because it was my idea and I got, you know, I got the buy-in to do it. It wasn't a strategic decision to say, 
community should be in marketing. In fact, you know, it started there and I'm really glad it started there and it had really good reasons and it grew up the way I wanted it to grow up, but I hightailed it out of marketing as fast as I could, realizing my alarm off. And so um, we'll get back to where it should live because ironically, it's living back in marketing these days in many, many organizations. But back then, uh, Salesforce was laser focused and maybe they still are um, on lead gen. It was like, it was a lead gen machine. And I still have a hard time with a major focus of community being lead gen. And it makes me uncomfortable when that's the number one goal of a community, at least in the ones that I build, I've been building or that they come to me. So. I couldn't really find a way to dial in the alignment of the strategy for the community with marketing. And it wasn't marketing's fault. It's my fault for not, you know, not, it's just not, or it's not even my fault. It's just, it's just not that. It was just a, not a fit. And yeah, so it would have been my fault. Of, yeah, we're just missing. And so it, yeah. it's, it was my responsibility more to say, okay, I need to not blame marketing or be like, what's the problem? Why can't you understand me? It's like, okay, I need to get out. I need to find myself a new home where they do believe in me and they do understand the value. And, and I went knocking on product store and that's not super normal either. But for me, you know, it's just kind of a little difficult to like, unpack all the things that go on in organizations. But I even said customer success before. It wasn't a fit for me at custom, in customer success at Salesforce for a variety of reasons that we don't need to really go into. But product was the thing. Because for me, the, the like, here's another cliche I'm in a botch, but like the silver thread or whatever the, the red thread, whatever they say, that was <laughs> the product. You know, though, that was the thing that every one of our community members wanted some kind of um need, ha had needs around whether it was they wanted to sell sell it be like a charter and better they want to grow their business they want to grow their career they wanted to be more effective and efficient using the product they wanted to build on top of it developers expanding their businesses what whatever it is it was the product and moving away from marketing putting myself in product selling it to our head of products it did this insanely wonderful thing for the community because this is no knock on marketing again, because they were, they're wonderful, they're brilliant at their jobs, but it's not, at the time it wasn't, it wasn't like I was, um, the marketing was in it for the customer back then, but product was, they were worshiped in the community. The head of product is this brilliant individual, Parker Harris, he was beloved. And so was all the product managers beloved. And so when I sat there among them, the community was like, whoa, this is business. This is, like she's for real. Like we're now in. there's no more marketing fluff. We're in, we're at the table. We have someone, we have like a way to be more effective and have our voices heard. And, and that just was magical for Salesforce. And it really, you can really track back to when I moved the community, all the programs there to the, the growth of the community. It was, it was a hockey stick kind of growth. And um, I attribute that to just being in the right place. I served them up like this perfect platter of beautiful, you know, like here's your golden goose. Here's your people that tell you what you want to know about your product, how to use it better, how to be more effective and efficient using it. And they were like, they were, they were taking it. So it was really, really wonderful for that. But I needed to be the one responsible for that. I had to do that and make that, um, make that push for it. Now, like, let's see if I had to do it again, because so I ended up, I took a lot of journeys. I ended up ironically back in, in, in a training organization because um, Trailhead is another whole story, but that became the democratized way, this fun way to learn. And, and having learning, democratized learning coupled with community is like the dream. And it really took community in an emotional, now it became an amazing. It wasn't just about product, it was about life changes. Now I can, I can learn for free. I can connect with mentors and now I can get a, a better job that I never dreamed I could be. So trailhead that eventually ate me up or I was reorged into trailhead. And here I was now back in, in kind of a learning uh, component in a very different way. Um, but the question I get asked all the time is very same thing. Like, where does it belong? And I say very generically, go where the money is, go as close to the money as you can. 
go to who cares and who's going to invest in you. It doesn't really matter enormously as long as you have the ability to serve the organization the way it needs to serve. As long as you're not going to be just like pigeonholed to only make the community about one particular thing. So it, it's an innovative leader that has the ability to understand that it's a service function and that has money to give you what you need to do to serve. Um, so that's like a super long evolution story, but if in, in I guess in a lot of cases that is marketing. Marketing has a lot of money. They do. They they do great things. They get a lot of money, and so if that's where it needs to live, and you can then serve, by all means. Um, I've seen really successful communities living in customer success when the alignment is more about best practice and um, adoption and uh, knowledge. As I've seen really success, my my preference is not to put in support only because it gets very, very siloed. I think you could do wonderful things with support in the organization you live in, but not get super pigeonholed. Um, those are my favorites these days. If, if, I can't, if I can't have my dream, which is a C-suite, and it sits you know, among the highest level, which is the dream, um, the, rea the reality is I'd say marketing and customer success are great options. Yeah, we've been having or, I mean, uh, products. I guess I, I lived in product. So sorry, product. So I, I mean, product is an interesting one, but it's pretty uncommon. It's pretty uncommon. Yeah, we've been having conversations around this internally as well to say, ultimately, we want to create a product that enables and empowers mm -hmm. community leaders to be so good at their job that they can only go to the C-suite. It only makes sense for them yeah. to have a seat at the highest table. But ultimately, that shouldn't be the focus as much as serving your community best and going wherever your yes. voice is represented and respected and then acted yes. on is the first yes. way to that. The C-suite will follow so That's long right. as you are sitting in whatever team is going to say, yes. not only do we hear you, we're going to action on that. Um, right, right. So I think yeah. that we're, I think that we are, we have similar, I think that we're standing on your shoulders a bit in that way, if I interpret Good. that correctly. Good. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that statement. And I think you know, I don't know when the world is going to shift uh, to to really having there be the true chief community officer. I think mean, we will have that title, and and that that's awesome. And no strike against the people have achieved it, but I'm talking like the people that literally have a role that reports to uh, you know the CEO that is not a community company. <laughs> We're talking like you know like a right. true value. Now I know really one or two people one in particular was a woman holly that i used to work with um worked with me at salesforce she reports to the ceo at a big uh security company and her ceo is just like if you could stamp out a ceo that's like him over and over again he sees the value he invests the value he promoted her into that role reporting to him for that very reason that's the dream the, um but until we're there we need to be realistic and and i'm pushing really hard to do that but it has to be right for the organization because in some cases if you do report to the CEO and it's not like a full blown everyone understands it. you're then proving yourself constantly why you should be in that role. And that's not the point, you know, you um, so I think we have more work to do is what I'm saying to till we really start achieving that. Um, but to your point, exactly, as long as we're heard and actioned and we're high enough in the organization where we're taken very seriously and are and what we're trying to accomplish, then and we get money and empowerment and, and you know, uh, engagement, then I'm good. I'm good to go. <laughs> it's a good start. I'm good to start there. I'm good like, start. okay, that's okay. We could start. That. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And then we'll have another conversation in maybe five years. And I think we'll be telling a very different story. Yeah, I agree. And I can only hope because I think as more tools come out to empower that, then that will mean that they will have helped in making that successful. Yeah, I agree that it's, it's just um, it, it's just going to be a different story. The set of the suite, the stack, the community stack is going to be different when when we invest, what we invest in. It's just I can't wait to have this conversation. We should put a little marker on our calendar, and in five years we should do this uncommon chat again and see and see. If I agree, but I'll up your ante. I'll say I see your. We should put a marker on it, and we should do it in two years. I have okay. I have high hopes. Hey, let's do um, it. Let's do it. So let's talk about how what you've learned from the past 18, 20, 21 years <laughs> informs what you're doing now mm -hmm. at your consulting business. Um, can you mm -hmm. talk to us a little bit about the kinds of clients you work with and what kinds of companies you see benefiting from building community today? And I have a hunch 
that it's uh, it's more than just what we would expect, right? It's not just new modern B2B SaaS or something. Uh, so I'd love to get no. your view on the landscape of who is and who should be building community today. Um, I think I can almost safely say with 100% certainty that everybody should. Um, now, I, I thought that before, and now that I've been at this for nearly two years and I've seen the stack of, like the stack up of the clients that have come stories that come to me, I'm convinced everybody needs it. It's just a matter of how do they need it? What does it look like? How does it manifest itself? What are the goals? What are they looking for? Um, but, but you're absolutely right. It is just like, it is not just B2B SaaS. In fact, I thought when I ventured out, that was going to be my jam was going to be, and I, and I wanted to add another word on it. What I thought it would be was enterprise. And it's just not, it's not actually um, true. I mean, it is true. Yes, that is very true, but I'm finding so much fun in building community earlier in a company's life cycle is what I'm finding is the, the most exciting thing that I've been able to see is um, more startup, late stage startups taking advantage of this community strategy as part of their growth strategy, as part of what they're building just immediately in either as they're charging towards going public or as they're charging towards another round of funding or as they're charging towards um, being acquired, it's a part of their strategy. And they're spending a good amount of money and spending a lot of time building a strategy, build a community early. And I love that. I think that that is, it's, it's using it as a differentiator. It's putting, it's setting a tone for companies. And these are companies in every kind of crazy different industries from travel to consumer electronics, to healthcare, to, I mean, you name it. Literally, it's I, I've dabbled in it too. And environmental sciences, uh, it's just it's un construction. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Like it just it, it goes on and on. And I think um, finding the glue of what's the reason why you're doing it is the fun part. And then building a strategy around it and watching watching it come to life is so much fun. So that's what I love most is seeing that it it isn't turning out with what I thought, and that I'm I'm like. Somebody says, do you think it's our time for community? I'm like, the answer is yes. It's just a matter of, are you ready to invest in it? And are you ready you know, to make it a part of your strategy? Yeah, you're like, I think it's your time now. And it also was your time two weeks ago and a year ago. Uh, yeah. So let's yeah. get on board. And it's true. It's kind of like the more you wait, the more you lose out. And it's, it's sadly, it's like kind of becoming table stakes. And not, I guess not sadly, it's amazing it's becoming table stakes. But now we're ready to like, people just need to do it right. Now people are right. just like, yes, I want to do it, but they're not, they're still not really investing the way they need to invest in it. They're just like, I want to do it. And it's becoming like social was like, yeah, we need a Twitter. We need a Twitter presence. It's like, yeah, we need a community, but like that, what does that mean? It's really empty. If you don't um, invest in it properly, invest in the right people to run it, give it the right budget, give it the right, you know, put it in the right place, give it and elevate it. Uh, so that's what I'm working on now is I'm spending less time convincing people they need community. And now I'm just helping them um, build the right infrastructure and the right uh, the right resources and, and budget around it to make it survive. Get your shot glass out because you're helping them build the right strategy. There you go. Strategy. You See, go. I'm strategy. telling you people are hammered. They're <laughs> hammered when they listen to our podcast. <laughs> so I imagine that you lead plenty of kickoff calls with these potential clients. And um, do you mm -hmm. see any patterns of commonalities across the first questions they always ask you? So I guess, you know, number one is, okay, should I really invest in this? And it's like, yes, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. And then you probably go on to say, like, are there basic first steps that you always recommend clients follow to be ready to build a community strategy? Yeah, uh, interestingly enough, I don't, I'm not in the business of convincing people they need community. So if they're coming to me, they're already there, which is great because I never, I didn't want to, that's not the way I want to run my business. I'm the person you come to when you want a community, you know, when you want it and you want to do it right and you want it to be successful in the shortest amount of time possible, that's realistic, you know, so I'm, I'm that person. So I find that my, the first parts of my conversation are more just trying to get at the why. Like, okay, you want it. Now, do you know why you want it? Why do you want it? Because I think they need to start understanding that they either don't know the answer to that question or that they, uh, maybe they, what they think they want is actually not what they want. And so for me, as soon as I then start working with them, that's where we start, that's where the game starts is okay. 
Let's start really honing in on this is what you want. Now, is this matched to what your customers want? Is this matched to what the rest of your business wants? And then let's start building the strategy around that. But I find that everybody skips that step and they go right to, we bought this tool and we hired this person. I'm like, what are you even doing? You don't even know what you're doing. You don't even know who your customer is. And so I try to reel people back and start with start with why you know why they want to do this and it, it's an interesting question and it's it's what i hear um time and time again so you have a really cool acronym i think that probably goes around with this which is v2mom yep. uh vision values vision values methods obstacles and metrics mm-hmm. wondering does that play into this like in terms of what you're advising oh, sure. for understanding both the long-term vision and the short-term de- deliverables and, and starting to orient teams around their, absolutely their why absolutely and that i absolutely cannot take credit for the v2 mom it is a salesforce tried and true unbelievable thing that we all have to do and i used to dread it and now i think it's an incredible strategy i've never seen and i don't even understand how companies don't do this they don't have their own process you know i got an opportunity many times to be in the room where mark benioff the salesforce ceo sat in a room with his top leaders and built the company's V2 mom for the year. And the ruthless prioritization that goes on in a process like this and what your focus is, what's your vision for the year, or maybe you're at the three years if you're in his case. And then just watching the, the methodologies pop out of that. And so we, and then from that, every single person, it cascaded down to every individual contributor. And that was posted publicly and everybody could see everybody's V2 mom. Now, I'm not trying to change people's strategies when I go into their companies. I'm not like, oh, you need to, you all need to adopt the V2 mom strategy at your company. That's not the point. The point is I now take that methodology and I use it to get them an incredible community strategy. And sometimes it literally is a templatized version of what I've taken from the V2 mom. But at minimum, we do ne- we never, never skip the step of vision. We never skip the step of what values we're aligning and the pillars of the strategy. And then from there, um, we talk about business metrics and measures. And then we, what is the programs and plans that are going to help execute that vision and stay true to our values? And then how are we going to measure success? And what's going to stop us from getting there? You know, and so whether it's not like an exact stepping through that process, ultimately, that's what I try to take um, people through the process of doing so that at the end of it, they've got a very clear path to success and they can measure each step of the way. So um, I love it. I Many people have turned it into a verb and they they V2 mom things in their life. They I did a V2 mom when I started my own business, you know, and so all of these things you can pull up and just remember where you are and see how you're tracking against your goals. So yeah, V2 mom is awesome. Yeah, two thumbs up. I love it. Uh, I think AWS has similar types of structures around Mm -hmm. just getting thoughts in front of other people so that you can all be aligned in terms of how you're giving and receiving these thoughts and then how they action into ideas. Um, I love you too, mom. I did not know of Salesforce's weight, which is really cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really amazing. And it, um, it just, the company is stay so focused. And I think that's why they do so well year over year is it just, there's just a laser focus. And that's not to say that, that the V2 mom doesn't change. You know, you do revisit it every six months. And But the, be- the beauty part of a V2 mom, the same thing goes with building community strategy, same thing goes with anything, is if something comes on, something comes off. So it's not like you just keep loading it on. It's like, okay, if these are our priorities, you know, and you just want to shove one in, and that's great, and that's like a business strategy or a community strategy, then then something's fallen off the bottom. So it's a it's a real great way to to prioritize ruthlessly and and really stay focused and not keep loading a bunch of stuff on and getting really off track with your strategy. So yeah, it's cool. And AWS, I I think I've I, I've been in a couple of different companies that have adapted your strategy and the writing of papers and you know it all. I have now written. 19 page dissertations that are v2 moms you know they're like all these different manifestations of each other but whatever it is do it just do it so that you know you've got some artifact that you can all stay aligned to yeah absolutely okay so you yeah. have a great client that calls me is like i i am in for community yeah. And I'm ready now to invest resources in it. I'm ready now to give more than one half person's 25% wow. time. 
You're Who like, are yes, you? all right, that's, we're starting there. So now they're looking to build out and hire their community-based team. When yeah. you're advising clients on hiring theirs, what mm -hmm. would you say are some key attributes that uh, people should look for when hiring community team members? Mm. Uh, so I try as much as I can to level up that job as high as I can. Uh, you know, they generally they're coming to me because they they either can't find somebody with uh, the executive enough strategy uh, to build that foundational layer. So they bring me on to help do that. Or um, they have someone on board that's maybe not at that level that may coach and guide that person through that process. But what I basically say is that I'm not there forever. So e eventually my goal is to get out and set you up with so much success, including the best possible possible person at the highest possible level that's going to execute on this strategy. So for me, the first step is like leveling that person um, or that hypothetical person at, at, at really at the highest level that I can. Um, the highest I think I've gotten is director level, which is super high. You know, that's like a very coveted yeah. title, director of community. And that's what I push for. If not director, then senior manager that's got like six months to a year and they're going to be a director with like that first set of major deliverables under them. Um, and for me, when I'm thinking about those people, those are the individuals that, that have a bit of experience and they do have that business acumen. You know, they've got the ability to step in in front of an executive suite and talk to people about the value of community without needing much coaching or guidance at all. So if you're getting to that level of director, that's something that I would expect. Um, but that doesn't mean we always get that. So oftentimes we have to move down this down the path. And when you go into more of the community manager, more of the junior community manager roles, I'm looking for people to think a little bit broader than just experience in community only because we're just not there yet as an industry. Um, it's just, you're gonna miss out on a lot of great people. So I start trying to expand the horizons of recruiters to look at people in incredibly intense, empathetic customer facing roles like customer support, <laughs> like people that um, are have spent a good amount of time in that kind of role makes an incredible community manager ultimately because of their connection to the customer, their empathetic nature, their ability to listen and then take action. Um, genius they make great great community managers if they're transitioning to that role um and, and ultimately that word empathy that's like trumps all you know you you can teach someone how to be a community manager you can teach the concepts of that but you cannot teach someone to be empathetic and care about the customer it just it has to be in them so i know that sounds a little squishy but like i look for that more than anything um and then i also just look for people that have done some uh you know some due diligence on why they care about being your community manager. So I don't just like want someone that is a social media manager that's just looking to transition into do something different. Like I want connection to the brand because so many jobs you can kind of phone it in, but community, no. Like it is like, it's hard work and you're- it, Yeah, there's you this sniff test. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so yeah, you gotta have it. You gotta have passion for what the business is doing, gotta have passion for the customer. And so they have, if they've not done that due diligence, I'm just like, move over. That's ridiculous. Um, let's see, yeah, those are some of my go-tos, I'd say. Yeah, and I don't think uh, empathy is too squishy of a topic. It may be squishy in terms of exacting mathematical definitions or something. Sure. But there is a very real, uh, you can, you. there's a really real palpable human feeling. Yeah. You can tell when someone actually does care about what you're yeah. saying or they're, or they're botting you, which is totally yeah. different. Yeah, um, 100%. <laughs> so I would be remiss if I didn't make good on my promise at the beginning of our conversation, which is to ask you about the podcast you host with uh, Brian Oblinger. Is it Oblinger mm -hmm. or Oblinger? Oblinger. Oblinger. We have, okay. we have jokes Sorry, all the Brian. time because no, because everybody always hacks his name and he hacks everyone's names because we start off the podcast rec um, basically recognizing people that have gotten into new jobs in community and he hacks everybody's name up. So it's all good. Amazing. <laughs> well, okay. I'm glad I can follow in the uh, tradition. Uh, so your <laughs> podcast is called In Before the Lock. And yeah. I'm wondering if you can tell us about your partnership with Brian, what you yeah. admire about each other's work and how the podcast came to be. Like what what is someone watching this, right? They should tune into In Before the Lock and what sure. should they expect to get from it? Yeah, so it was Brian's idea. Um, and he wasn't even doing consulting at the time. He was working for another company. 
And we, he pitched me when we were sitting having queso, which now we do on a regular basis Perfect. to just, yeah, because I mean, best things happen over queso. Oh, and yeah. um, we wanted to do something different. You know, there's a lot of podcasts out there. We wanted to go long form. And because I didn't just want to be on this like fluffy podcast that just like interviews people and then just like goes on about our way. Not to, not to say that that's what all podcasts are. Just like I didn't think they needed another one of me doing that with other people. I had a lot of knowledge in my brain and I wanted it out. And the whole goal of me going out on my own was to level up this industry, was to was to make us better, was to make community better, was to make it a staple, was to make it more me's of the world. So it's not just me forging, you know, alone with a lot of, with a few other people. So I was like, I got to get this knowledge out of my brain as fast as I can. So I take on a bunch of clients, but like, that's not going to do it. I need more. And we didn't want to feel constrained to like a certain time box. So we picked meaty, meaty topics and we just wanted to go long form. So we both aligned on that as like, okay, I'm in for that. If I get to just pick these meaty topics, he creates this beautiful outline. It sounds unscripted, but it's actually very, it's very outline scripted, not scripted, but, um, and then we just go deep. So a, a podcast might be an hour and 25 minutes long and it yeah, might be 40. Yeah, they're long and it's I ridiculous. It. So I basically say like, this is the kind of podcast you put your earphones in, you take your dog for a walk or you do your laundry or you listen in a couple of different installments because Brian has broken it up um, into chapters and things. And then the other thing we wanted to do was give tons away for free. We were like, okay, we're just going to deep dive on topics and whatever we talk about, we're going to templatize and we're going to put it in show notes. So people can just grab these templates and use them if they can, or come to us if they need more help or whatever the case may be. Um, but just give a bunch of stuff away to just make people better and, and make them more effective and efficient. So that was our whole reasoning for doing this. And we're not running out of topics anytime soon. We always go in and think, oh, this topic's going to be like, we're going to do this one quickly. And then an hour and a half later, we're still talking about like the tiniest, nichiest topic because we have a lot of passion. And I think what's great about Brian and I, if you haven't ever listened, is we have very different personalities. Brian is extremely uh, methodical. He's very, um, he's very templatized. He's, he's buttoned up and he has it all dialed. Like the guy is a machine and he is incredible. Mm -hmm. And I learned so much about his analytical nature. Maybe that's because he came from a data background. And he's also been doing this for ages as well. And I'm a little more flyby. I've learned on on the go, you know, and, and now I've put I've placed the strategy around it. But some of my early decisions were gut decisions that I then turned into strategies. So it's fun to listen to our our interactions because his is like, I I planned this, I did this, we executed on this, and I was like, well, I had no idea what the hell I was doing. And so I did these things and then it turned out good, and then I laid the strategy and the foundation. So it's a fun dynamic to have the two because then someone's going to fit into one of those um yeah so it's really been fun we had no idea that it was going to be this much fun um but we look forward to it every single time and i think people are enjoying it um the joy i get is when i get notes from people saying they use the templates or you know it motivated them to do something new or i don't know you know this just all the things that keep me going is just knowing that this content's helping people we always ask this last question at Uncommon and Uncommon Room, we do think that a community is strongest when it uplifts one another yeah. um, and it's helpful to each other. And so to that end, uh, we ask each of our experts like you to choose a nonprofit whose cause and mission you want to highlight, mm -hmm. and then we donate in your honor. And so oh. can you tell us about the organization that you choose to dedicate your Uncommon support to? And we are happy to highlight them and then to donate. That's so awesome. I love this. Um, and it's easy for me because I put all my passion and energy around the National MS Society. So I've been supporting multiple sclerosis for over a decade now. One of my closest friends is, has been affected by it. And we've been biking for MS with a team at Salesforce. And now I bike with an extended team with Salesforce as the end friends part of it. But we um, raise money every single year for, for MS. And then we go on a two-day bike ride with over 199 miles we ride to try to get closer to a cure. So MS is very close to my heart. So anything you can do, there is no cure. So it's very, very important. And it affects my demographic of people too. So it's really, um, you know, it's it, and it's unbelievable when you think about it. Like if you start talking about this now, 
it has uh, some connection. Like everybody knows someone that's affected by MS. And so, um, yeah, if that I would be honored. Um, and thank you very much. Of course, no, we're honored. And it's been really mm -hmm. neat to hear the different types of organizations um, and causes that experts like you yeah. bring up. And I think there is a, there's a holistic, with all of yeah. our powers combined, we will each be supporting something yeah. um, really relevant and helpful, I think, across different communities. So awesome. thank you. Yeah, I love that. Good. Thank you. Thanks for having me.